Hello guys, again, real quick, I'm coming on to share the saint of the day today. The saint of the day today is Pope Saint Damasus the first, the first, Pope Saint Damasus the first, that's today's saint. And there's a little bit about him, a lot about him. <laughs> <laughs> Hang in with me. All lovers of scriptures have reason to celebrate this day. Damasus was the pope who commissioned St. Jerome to translate the scriptures into Latin, the Vulgate version of the Bible. Damasus was a 60-year-old deacon when he was elected bishop of Rome in 366. His reign that started when another group decided to elect a different pope. Both sides tried to enforce their selection through violence. Though the physical fighting stopped, Damasus had to struggle with these opponents throughout his years as pope. Damasus may not have won this battle directly, but he won the war by initiating works that outlasted all his opponents. Not only did he, did he commission the Vulgate translation, but he also changed the liturgical language of the church from Greek to Latin. He worked hard to preserve and restore the catacombs, the graves of the martyr, martyrs and relics. Damascus was a writer. But he didn't author many volumed treatises as other Christian writers did. Damasus liked to write epigrams in verse, short sayings that capture the essence of what needed to be said. He wrote many epigrams of martyrs and saints, and he wrote one about himself that shows his humility and the respect he had for the martyrs. In a Roman cemetery is the papal crypt he built. All that is left of him there, however, is this. I, Damascus, wished to be buried here, but I feared to offend the ashes of these holy ones. Instead, when he died in 384, he was buried with his mother and sister. From the decree of Damasus, attributed to Damasus. The arrangement of the names of Christ, however, is manifold. Lord, because he is spirit. Word, because he is God. Son, because he is the only begotten son of the father. Man, because he was born of the virgin. Priest, because he offered himself as a sacrifice. Shepherd, because he is a guardian. Worm, because he rose again. Mountain, because he is strong. Way, because there is a straight path through him to life. Lamb, because he suffered. Cornerstone, because instruction is his. Teacher, because he demonstrates how to live. Son, because he is the illuminator. Truth, because he is the father. Life, because he is the creator. Bread, because he is flesh. Samaritan, because he is a merciful protector. Christ, because he is anointed. Jesus, because he is a mediator. Vine, because we are redeemed by his blood. Lion, because he is king. Rock, because he is firm. Flower, because he is the chosen one. Prophet, because he has revealed what is to come. And this was from the faith of the early fathers. He, um, he wrote that, I guess. Damasus, Damasus' love 
and respect for scripture is shown in the authorization of the Vulgate translation. Spend 30 minutes today reading and meditating on scripture. Try to make this a daily habit. One way to do this is keep a Bible open by your bedside and read it first thing in the morning and the last thing before you turn out the light at night. Amen. That's a good uh, that's a good uh, rule to do. I need a little more room on my night table though. I have all kinds of stuff right now. <laughs> but no, I tend to um spend a lot of time in the morning reading um the daily reading I like to read and at night maybe I can I can incorporate that in somehow cuz I don't normally read the Bible before going to bed. But I do try to spend time with God in intervals during the day. It says here, a prayer for him, a prayer for St. Damasus. St. Damasus, instead of worrying about the short term of life on earth, you took God's view and looked to the things that last. Pray for me that I may be able to look beyond immediate popularity and fleeting favors and choose to do the things that God wants me to do. Amen. Amen. So yes, that's another person now that we know about. St. Damasus, Pope the First, And he was also, I read somewhere else, that he was also a Mexican. Um, he was a Mexican man. Where did I read that? remember but he was a Mexican man and um, he was very humble he was very humble um, so that's another good saint to remember and he also wrote something else which was very good as well let me look it up real quick for you it's not very long but I really liked it it's a special prayer that he wrote um, in a book and this one kind of stood out to me anyway let me see if I can find it real quick here <clears throat> Here it is. My words are written to the successor of the fisherman, to the disciple of the cross, as I follow no leader but Christ. So I communicate with none but your blessedness, that is, with the chair of Peter. For this, I know, is the rock on which the church is built. This is the house where alone the Paschal lamb can be rightly eaten. This is the ark of Noah, and he who is not found in it shall perish when the flood prevails. And that was written by Damascus, by, by Pope Damasus I. I don't know the date, though. <laughs> I don't know the date, but, it, but it's good, isn't it? Okay, so that's the same for today, guys. And I will let you go, and I'll talk to you guys later. Hey guys, good morning. How are you this morning? It's still morning, isn't it? Yeah, it's 1030. I had to pick and choose which one I was going to do today live because I had a doctor's appointment this morning, and um, I'm a little behind on my schedule and I got to make sure I do everything before a certain time because at 11 is when my mom starts waking up and I got to start my <laughs> my routine. And so I, since I had um, old readings, I went ahead and picked an old one to share with you guys. So you guys got an old reading for the day and I'm going to do the saint because the saints are an interesting one also. And I'm really enjoying these saints of the day. I'm learning so much from them. So this saint for today is, oh, and by the way, my doctor's appointment that I was worried about, my thyroid check, they, they, they did an ultrasound and they found nodules and they were worried about them. And today they said they're just going to keep an eye on them. So I have to go back in a year. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Antico, for your prayers for me and all you guys. Because um, I just have to go back in a year for a checkup. Make sure my nodules are still the same size. But hopefully the, they, they will be. And I don't have to get my thyroid removed. That really scared me. Not only just getting it removed, but um, because of the COVID out there in the hospitals, I was... I was so stressed out. So 
So thank you, Jesus, for once again taking care of us. And um, yes, amen. So today's saint is, oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Antico. I love you. Um, today's saint is a really good saint. It is one that I actually learned today about. I didn't know about him. He is... This, uh, this is John. Um, he changed his name a couple of times, but he's known as St. John of the Cross. He was born Juan de Yepes y Álvarez in, in Fontiveros, Avila, Spain in 1542. His father was employed by wealthy family members as an accountant but they disowned him when he married a poor woman from the lower class. As a result of his family's poverty, John's family suffered greatly. His father died when he was three, and his older brother, Luis, died too years after that, likely because of malnutrition. John's mother eventually found work weaving, which helped her to feed her family. As a child, John was sent to a boarding school for poor and orphaned children. He was given a religious education from a young age and chose to follow a religious path. Even as a child, he served as an acolyte at an Augustinian monastery. As he grew older, he went to work in a hospital while attending a Jewish school a Jewish school. In 1563, he was able to join the Carmelite order and took the name John of St. Matthias. He made vows the following year and was sent to the university in Salamanca to study theology and philosophy. He became an expert in the Bible and dared to translate the Song of Songs into Spanish an act which was controversial since the church forbade the translation of the Bible from Latin, a measure to protect the original meaning in the scriptures. John became a priest in 1567 and considered joining the Carthusian order, where monks lived cloistered in individual cells. He was attracted by the simple and quiet life. However, he encountered Teresa of Avila, a charismatic Carmelite nun. Teresa asked John to follow her. John was attracted by the strict routine followed by Teresa, a routine she hoped to reintroduce to her order, as well as her, devout, as well as her devotion to prayer and simplicity. Her followers went barefoot and were therefore known as the Discalced Carmelites. On November 28, 1568, Teresa founded a new monastery, the name day. That same day, John changed his name again to John of the Cross. Within a couple of years, John and his fellow friars relocated to a larger site for their monastery. He remained at that location until 1572. In 1572, John traveled to a villa at the invitation of Teresa to become her confessor and spiritual guide. He remained in a villa until 1577. While there, he had a vision of Christ and made a drawing that remains to this day called Christ from Above. The little drawing shows Christ on a cross looking down on him from above. The image has been preserved for centuries. And this is what it looked like. And you guys probably noticed the image. I know I do. When I saw that, I said, oh my goodness, an artist made paintings and um, jewelry, beautiful crucifixes. His name was Salvatore Dali. He was the one that made these beautiful crosses. And I happened to 
have one that I brought from Argentina when I was there. I don't know if you guys can see it, but you see the image of Jesus hanging and you see his head, his health, his head is tilted down. I don't know if you can see it, but his head is tilted down, downwards, just like this. Such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful image. Um, Jesus looking down on us. Around 1575, a rift within the Carmelite order began to grow and create controversy between various monas mon monastic houses. Monastic houses. I'm sorry, I'm so bad at pronouncing these words. I'm trying, guys. Around 1575, a rift within the Carmelite order began to grow and create controversy between various monastic houses. There was disagreement between the discalced Carmelites and the ordinary Carmelites over reform. The discalced Carmelites sought to restore the original strict routine and regimen that the order had when it was founded. In 1432, the strict rules of the order were mitigated, relieving the Carmelites of some of their most strict rules. Some Carmelites, such as Teresa of Avila, felt this liberation of their rules had interfered with the order and practice. Teresa, along with John, sought to restore the original rule. The Carmelites had been undergoing reform since 1566 <coughs> under the direction of two canonical visitors from the Dominican order sent by the Vatican. The intervention of the Holy See as well as the political people of King Philip II and his court led to dramatic, even violent, disagreements between the Carmelites. In late 1577, John was ordered to leave the monastery in a villa and to return to his original house. However, John's work to reform the order had already been approved by Papal Nuncio, who was a higher authority. Based on that, John chose to ignore the lower order and stay. On December 2, 1577, a group of Carmelites broke into John's residence and kidnapped him. He was taken by force to the order's main house in Toledo. He was brought before a court and placed on trial for disobedience. He was punished by imprisonment. A cell was made for him in the monastery that was so small he could barely lie on the floor. He was fed only bread and water and occasionally scraps of salt fish. Each week he was taken into public and lashed, then returned to his cell. His only luxuries were a prayer book and an oil lamp to read by it. To pass the time, he wrote poems on paper that was smudged to him by the friar charged with guarding his cell. Oh, that was smuggled. Oh, so somebody was smuggling him the paper to do these poems. John became known as a remarkable and influential poet, especially following his death. He has been cited as an influence to many poets, mystics, and artists, even Salvador Dali. That's the one that I told you about. Salvador Dali was his name, and he's the artist that made this beautiful um, image of Jesus. He's the one that brought it to life. The image of Jesus brought to life. I have him on the crucifix. I love this crucifix. It's so small, though. I'm more of a big girl. I like big stuff, but it's beautiful. Um, where was I? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the Carmelites broke into John's residence. Uh, he jo okay. John became known as a remarkable and influential poet, especially following his death. He had been cited as an influence to many poets, mystics, and artists, even Salvador Dali. 
After nine months, John managed to pry his cell door from its hinges and escape. He joined Teresa's nuns in Toledo and spent six weeks in the hospital to recover. In 1579, he was sent to the town of Baza to be rector of a new college and to support the discalced Carmelites in Analdusia. Analdusia. In 1580, Pope Gregory formally authorized the split between the discalced Carmelites and the rest of the order. This ended the rift within the order. At that time, there were 500 members in the order living in 22 houses. During the last few years of his life, John traveled and established new houses across Spain. In 1591, John became ill with a skin condition that resulted in an infection. He died on December 14, 1591. John of the Cross died. Shortly following his burial, there was a dispute over where he should be buried. The dispute was resolved by removing his legs and arms. Ugh. Over the years, parts of his body were placed on display or buried across several places. St. John of the Cross was beautified by Pope Clement X in 1672 and canonized by Pope Benedict the 13th in 1726. He is the patron of contemplatives, mystics, and Spanish poets, and his feast day is celebrated today, December 14th. Wow, that was a long story. I'm sorry, guys. It was so long, but it's good to hear all about his whole life. So now I feel like I know him. I know John of the Cross now, which is awesome. It's so exciting to learn about a different um, a different one every day, a different saint every day. And the prayer to this saint is so beautiful. I love it. It's very short and quick, but it's very, very reaches my heart today. It's pray St. John of the Cross prayer of peace to calm your mind. Oh, we all need that, don't we? Oh, bless Jesus, grant me stillness of soul in thee. Let thy mighty calmness reign in me. Rule me, O thou king of gentleness, king of peace. Give me control, control over my words, thoughts, and actions. From all irritability, want of meekness, want of gentleness, O dear Lord, deliver me. By thine own deep patience, give me patience, stillness of soul in thee. Make me in this and in all more and more like thee. Amen. Amen. Yes, the peace of the Holy Spirit fill us so that we can spread it, right? Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, blessed day, guys. Hi, Jocelyn. Bear with me. It's a very short story they write about him. It's not very long at all, but there's a lot of big words, and you know me and big words. <laughs> so bear with me as I try to pronounce them correctly. This is the saint for today, December 16th. His name is Saint Addo of Vienna. Saint Addo. An archbishop and scholar, Addo was born in Sense and educated at the Benedictine Abbey of Fieris. Albert Lupus Cervantes, an, ex, an outstanding humanist of the time, trained Addo and was impressed with obvious holiness of the young man. A noble by birth, Addo renounced his inheritance and became a Benedictine, in time assigned to the Monastery of Prum, near Trier, Germany. Addo's holiness, Addo's holiness made him enemies, and he was forced to leave Prum. He was going 
to go to Rome, and he went to Rome on a pilgrimage and remained there for two years. He then went to Ravenna, where he found an old copy of the Roman Martyrology. Using this, Ado wrote a new version, published in 858. In Linus, Ado was welcomed by St. Romagius, the archbishop. He served as a pastor in Lyons until 860, when he became the archbishop of Vienna, appointed by Pope Nicholas I. Ado reformed the clergy in Vienna and wrote the lives of St. Desarius and St. Theodorus. Theodorus. He also opposed the actions of Luther II, the king of Lorraine, who tried to set aside his lawful wife to marry his mistress. Luther bribed officials to get a divorce from his queen. Theoburga, but was undone when, Abu, when Addo went to Rome and denounced the plot to the Pope. Addo remained in Vienna until his death in 875. Amen. So yes, that was the Pope. The Pope, not the Pope. <laughs> He looks like a pope. That's why I said that. I looked at his picture and he looks like a pope, doesn't he? He looks so, you know, I think they they shape the heads like that, like big up here in the, in the brain parts, like really big, because these guys were very smart. I think that's why a lot of these older pictures are like that. They're like... They're big here in the head. It's because they're really smart. They were very smart. And he was very noble. He came from a noble family, but he didn't want um, all the riches of that life. He wanted to be for God. He wanted to follow God 100%. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Um. Yes, so... We need to be more like him, right? We need to be more like him. And he and and people, because he was so smart, people would try to get him to go the other way, to come and work for them, to come and do this and that. But no, Ado stayed very strong in his beliefs. And even, even to the point that um, when he saw an injustice done, he spoke up, especially right here. Um, where it says that um, he also opposed the actions of Luther II, the king of Lorraine, who tried to set aside his lawful wife to marry his mistress. He spoke up, but he didn't allow it. And he didn't care for the consequences. He was very, a very um, God-loving man, and he became a saint. Amen. So I looked for a prayer that was specifically for him, but I could not find that prayer. I did not find it. I looked and I looked and I looked. So I found another prayer which kind of pertains to all of us because we're all healing of something, right? We're all, we all have healing that needs to be done. So let me find that prayer real quick so we can pray it to start our day right. Oops. Okay, here it is. It's a short one. Lord, I come before you today in need of your healing hand. In you, all things are possible. Hold my heart within yours and renew my body, mind, and soul. I am lost, but I am singing. You gave us life. And you also give us the gift of infinite joy. Give us all the strength to move forward on the path you've laid out for us. Guide us toward better health and give us the wisdom to identify those you've placed around us to help us get better. 
In your son Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, we are surrounded by godliness. We just need to grab onto it, right? We need to surround ourselves with um, godly people, people that have our best interest at heart. And we need to see and hear things of God, right? So we need to make sure we need to guard what we see. We need to guard what we're listening to. And sometimes we need to guard the people around us to make sure that they have our best interest also. We need to pray to God to send those people along our path. Amen. I love you guys. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Hello, guys. Hello. Coming on real quick for the saint of the day. The saint today is Saint Mary de Rosa. Saint Mary de Rosa is today's saint of the day. And her story, let's see if I can hold this up while I read. Her story is a very good one. St. Mary Paula de Rosa, December 15. The pounding on the barricaded door of the military hospital sent every heart thudding in terror. In the middle of the war in Barcia, Italy, in 1848, the wounded, sick, and those who cared for them knew what that pounding meant. The shouts from beyond the door came from soldiers, not obeying any command, but their inner desire to destroy and plunder. Who could do anything to stop them? The only people here were some sisters, the handmaids of charity, who devoted themselves to helping the sick. The doctors had not even wanted them there. The doctors wanted medical people who were secular and military, not nuns. And in the face of this new danger, they were even more useless, worse than useless, because that Paula, as she was known, De Rosa was actually moving to open the door. When the door swung open, the soldiers saw their way saw their way, blocked with a great crucifix held by Paula de Rosa and two candles held by two of the six sisters who stood by her. Suddenly their frenzy to destroy disappeared. The fool of shame before this display of courage and faith, they slunk back into the shadows. Throughout her life, Paula de Rosa was never afraid to open the door on a new opportunity to serve God, especially when she was unsure of what lay beyond. People who didn't know her well must have thought she was too frail and delicate for these ventures. But she came armed not only with her faith, but boundless energy, intelligence, and hunger to serve. Born in 1813, she had tackled enormous projects from the time she was 17, arranging retreats and special missions for her parish, and setting up a woman's guild. Because of all she accomplished, when she was only 24, she was asked to be supervisor of a workhouse for poor girls. After two years, she became concerned because there was no place for the girls to go at the end of the day. Night held special dangers for these girls, and Paula wanted to give them a safe place to stay. The trustees refused to provide that place. For Paula, the choice was easy. She once said that she could never go to bed without a clear conscience, with a clear conscience, if she had missed. Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Let me go back. Um, it says, um, where was I? It says, 
For Paula, the choice was easy. She once said that she could never go to bed with a clear conscience if she had missed a chance to do some good. So she quit the workhouse to set up a boarding house for poor girls while helping her brother with a school for the deaf. At 27, she stood before another door. She was appointed superior of the Handmaids of Charity, a religious society whose purpose was to dedicate all their time and attention to the suffering in hospitals. With her friends, Gabriella Bornati and Monsignor Pinzoni, she won the respect of those who, taught, who thought of these handmaids as intruders. Then in 1848, her whole life seemed to fall apart. First, she lost Gabriella, and then Monsignor Pinzoni died, leaving her without the support and friendship she had come to depend on. War started in Europe, and her homeland was invaded. Facing that kind of grief and turmoil, many others would have crawled into bed and pulled the covers over their head. But Paula had always been opportunity, has always seen opportunity in everything that came her way. War meant that many would be wounded and displaced by the war. So she and her sisters went to work at a military hospital and even went out to the battlefields to give spiritual and physical comfort to the wounded and dying. She died in 1855, going through the final door, unafraid and joyful to be joining her Lord forever. In her footsteps, Mary de Rosa would go out at a moment's notice if she felt that someone needed her help. The next time someone you know needs your aid, don't put off helping and make excuses. Drop what you're doing and give them what they need. And the prayer... Let me give you this other picture to look at for a little bit. <laughs> oh, she's so awesome. And the prayer is, St. Mary, you weren't afraid to take new opportunities. It's frightening when we are asked to do something that is different or new. We would rather stay in our safe and comfortable routines. Help us to embrace each other obstacles. All, everything, and all the obstacles in our path as a new opportunity to serve God. Amen. Amen. Wow. That made me cry at the end. She was like Mother Teresa. Just didn't stop. Didn't stop. And she went to, to answer the door full of angry soldiers with a crucifix. Wow. That's faith. That's faith. So that was today's saint, and she really deserves the sainthood. Saint Mary de Rosa, today's saint. Hello, guys. Have a great afternoon. I'll see you back around 3, 4.